Can you dig it? It's time for another episode of the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and Adriana Robinson, our producer and engineer who makes this garden show grow. All right, so it's August, Stacy, or if we were to describe it as an adjective, it's August. Either way you look at it, it's hot. And it brings up the question today, can plants get a sunburn? Oh, absolutely they can. Absolutely they can. And in future shows, we'll talk about other weather sensitivities like wind or humidity or drought or freeze. But heat and sunburn has actually been in the news. Uh, In Arizona, the saguaro cactus are collapsing or some of them are collapsing due to the heat. And wow, I guess I don't blame them after more than 30 consecutive days of over 100 degrees. Right. And they don't have a very deep root system. So if there aren't a lot of resources sort of in that you know, surface level for them. They they can't take it. And that's really a tragedy because saguaro cactuses are so special and so beautiful. I mean, I guess the good news is if they do collapse, they'll tend to just grow up. Right. But hopefully they don't do that over like hiking trails and that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> also worldwide, of course, we've talked about olive trees before. We talked about them last year in Europe. And again, having problems with heat and uh, drought. So, You know, the Norwegians always uh, had this saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. I think they say that in Minnesota also. Yeah, I've heard that before. (laughs) I don't know that I agree. And you might be able to say that when it comes to cold or possibly rain, but I don't think you can say that when it comes to heat because there's really only so far you can go. Well, it could possibly also be said about plants that uh, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad placement. But what we're talking about here is uh, extremes. And when you have extremes, well, plants can get sunburned. They, of course, love sunlight. They need to bask in the sun to live. But uh, they also produce a natural uh, sunscreen. Uh, to help them deal with the UV rays. And it's quite a fascinating topic. I didn't know about that. Yeah. So sunscreen makes for great conversation because it's always topical. So true, Rick. So true. Thank you very much. (laughs) Well, you know, it could be argued that some plants are fair skinned. When we talk about plants that like shade or like to be in the shade, Uh, They generally have uh, common characteristics where they tend to be thin-leafed, larger-leafed, hostas, of course, a great example, to uh, shade the roots. Uh, And they, if they get too much sun, can bleach. And, Stacy, there's a a difference between plants bleaching and plants scorching. And in hot August or August weather, we can see plants sometimes take it to the point of scorch. Definitely. I mean, at this point in the season, if something has been stressed through a variety of other factors, low water, you know, um, other consistent excessive heat, damage from insects or, you know, pests or other things like that, then by by August, that wear is really starting to show. And, it, you know, they don't have the resources or strength to deal with it at the time when the heat and light are at their most intense. Yeah, and when we take intense heat and then we add to the mix drought or lack of water, well, that really gets things uh, into motion. So, like I said, I find the notion of plant sunscreen fascinating. You know, I think also about how in winter here in the Midwest or the North, we'll use a pine resin spray to coat broadleaf evergreens, kind of a winter sunscreen, so to speak, also. And so it's not too odd to think about it. And of course, as our environment changes and we manipulate plants through breeding to optimize productivity, it's important to have a full understanding of how plants operate at every level. And that includes UV protection. I have had interest, and I think we'll do a future show on this too, uh, listen to a speaker talking about the zeitgeist of the 2020s is to prairie up, to prairie up. And I noticed on Amazon a book written in 1915 by Wilhelm Miller is still available, The Prairie Spirit in Landscape Gardening, 
and you can buy it uh, on Amazon. And it talks about creating that prairie style look in your landscape. Well, I love it. It's what I primarily go for. I like things to look wild and knitted together. And it has several, I mean, most of the plants that I grow are naturally, you know, pretty drought tolerant, but also the way that they grow in that sort of prairie like community. I mean, I'm not going to claim I have a real prairie, but um, having everything so close together, all their, they help shade each other's roots. So they're really uh, resilient, even, you know, during periods that we had earlier this season where we had, you know, no rain essentially for two months. Yeah. That prairie look, uh, they say that there's three basic principles, conservation of native scenery, restoration of local vegetation, and repetition of a dominant line. So a dominant line in the landscape. So kind of fun to to think about. But today, of course, we think about sunburn. There's been a fair amount of work done by Purdue University on this subject. We're going to post uh, that story at our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. But uh, they basically identified a plant's ability to develop what is, I guess I'll call it a natural sunscreen to, uh, to help these plants deal with extreme hot temperatures. And I want to remind folks that there is a heat zone map. We often talk about USDA hardiness zones as it relates to minimum temperature every year. But there's also a map that uh, is called the heat zone map. And we're going to put that also at the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And that heat zone map is kind of interesting. It it identifies the average number of days above 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius that you can expect. And your plant on trial today uh, will be able to apply that in the heat zone map because some plants can take more heat or more days of heat than others, obviously. Uh, absolutely. It's all in their resilience and I guess partly to do with that, that sunscreen. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, uh, when we talk about weather sensitivity and heat and light, we also look at duration or photo period, and it refers to the amount of time a plant is exposed to light. So a photo period controls flowering in many plants. Uh, You've got the uh, three categories, the short day, long night, the long day, short night, or the day neutral. And, you know, it causes me to think about uh, uh, plants like poinsettias Mm -hmm. or mums coming up on the radar or Christmas cactus who need uh, the shorter daylight uh, in order to uh, bring out the bloom and the beauty. Right. The the day length triggers the bloom or bulb formation in the case of something like garlic or, you know, even spring flowering bulbs. In so many cases, it's it's not just the time of year. It's how much daylight versus nighttime it's experiencing. I mean, poinsettias are a classic example that a lot of people are familiar with, but it impacts so, so many plants. Now, the key, of course, to avoid sun scorch or sunburn is to put a plant in the appropriate location Uh, Know what type of location your plant wants to be in, mulching and watering, making sure that it can handle some of these uh, heat extremes. Have you experienced any uh, scorch in your garden this year? I have not, but, you know, I, and I truly feel for everybody who's been under extreme heat, but, you know, knock on wood, here in West Michigan, it's been, we haven't really had any intense heat to speak of. I mean, we've had handful of days around 90. Um, So I am not really seeing too much of that in my garden. But, you know, I do want to say when you're talking about, you know, withstanding all these weather trials, it's really important for people to understand that particularly at this time of year, if something is looking really bad or apparently has died as a result of exposure to the heat, don't just dig it out. Don't give up on it because a lot of plants will just say, I'm out. I'm conserving my resources for the rest of the season. I'll see y'all next spring. So it's worth it to, even if something, you know, looks really bad and you're, it's kind of killing you on the inside to look at that every day. Uh, you know, they, they, a lot of plants will just go dormant. Um, and, you know, I can think of, you know, uh, Dicentra, Bleeding Heart is right. another good example, is one good example, but there's lots of other plants that just, they just shut down and that's their normal response. So don't freak out necessarily if something looks dead, uh, just give it more time and it's probably not going to waste its resources and reemerging at this point in the year when the photo period has you know decreased significantly, right. our, our nights are getting much longer. It's going to wait until next spring to show itself. Yeah. 
plants have amazing resiliency and they have built-in protections to deal with these sorts of things. Again, take a look at that study. Uh, that's at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Today we live, work, and play in controlled environments, climate-controlled homes, cars, workplaces, even athletic stadiums. We get to enjoy ideal conditions, but unfortunately for plants and turf, well, environmental changes do impact them daily. We're going to talk about a plant that stands up to the heat and has natural sunscreen coming up on Plants on Trial. That's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Before we put today's plant on trial, you know, last week we talked about blue plants, blue yeah. flowers, and our favorite blue plants. And we did not mention a plant that I have growing in my garden that I realized is an absolute stunner, super easy to grow blue flowering plant. It is our native flax. Linum oh, perenne. Oh, you're right. And I have it in my garden. It's a great plant for pollinators and supports all sorts of different butterflies and their larvae. And wow, what an absolutely gorgeous blue those flowers are. And they bloom all summer. I mean, for mine, it's just every single day, there's a handful of flowers and they're just this like beautiful, happy blue face smiling up at you in the garden. And it's a nice plant because it's um, it's very like thin and wispy. So it really weaves nicely amongst the other plants in the garden. So I just want to put that out there. I, I was I like, I couldn't believe when I was walking in the garden, I said, I have this in my garden. And we didn't even mention it when we were listing all the blue flowers. So oh, blue flowers, you know, it's obviously we can talk about it for a long time. We talked about it last week. It's kind of controversial also. And that's what makes it fun? We're all in pursuit of that beautiful <laughs> blue flower. Well, I would say perennial flax. And if you like to nice. do fiber or, or anything like that, you can spin your own linen if you really <laughs> want to get into it. But it's a self-sowing annual or a self-sowing perennial, which, you know, how I love my self-sowers. So yes. it just kind of seeds on its own. Definitely one to add to your list. And it's one that would look quite stellar with today's plant on trial. Mm -hmm. And that plant is Pugster White Butterfly Bush. I love that plant, especially if it's planted in areas where you're going to entertain or enjoy the evening hours, yes. even after the sun goes down. You know, it's a, a white flowering plants are a classic choice for busy people who might only get to enjoy their gardens in the evening because the white really does seem to shine out from the garden. It really takes on, you know, an otherworldly quality, especially if there is some moonlight or even, you know, some artificial lighting. It really does just bring something so, so special. And I think it's unfortunate that generally speaking, white flowers don't really get a fair shake. Right. You know, exactly. there are those people out there who have their white flower themed gardens. And that is from a very classic English uh, garden design methodology. And it's beautiful. But for the most part, I think when people are at the garden center and say, looking at all of the pugster butterfly bushes, you know, at the garden center and they're seeing blue, they're seeing pugster blue, they're seeing pugster pink, they're seeing pugster amethyst. And they're like, wow, look at all these gorgeous colors. And then they're like, oh, and there's white. But I, I think that the pugster white, the, all of the pugsters have extra large flowers. So you've seen these before, right? Yep. They're dwarf mm -hmm. butterfly bushes. They get to be about two feet tall and two feet wide. And the flowers are exceptionally large, very, very large, especially in comparison to the plant. And that's one of the things that makes this so eye-catching. Um, but all of them are beautiful. But really, white is one that I don't think enough people realize how much it can bring to the garden. And especially if you feel like you're not very like confident in your color you know, design, which there is no such thing as a lack of confidence. You just put your colors together and eventually it'll work itself out. That's what I've learned <laughs> this year <laughs> in the garden. But white is a great one if you want to keep a more restrained palette. If you don't know what color is needed, if you feel like something's just kind of off, mm -hmm. adding a little bit of white, it goes with just about everything and really can work wonders in making the colors around it pop. It's a social butterfly. That's what it is. It likes to entertain in the evening hours. Uh, and that's that's what I love about it. I mean, this plant makes my heart flutter, this butterfly plant. And it's not pure white. It does, in the, the center of the flowers, there's a little yellow dot right. that, you know, helps to instruct the butterflies and moss as to where the, uh, the good stuff is, the nectar that they are attracted to. And another reason why I love Pugster White Butterfly Bush of all of the series, because white butterfly bush and white 
flowers in general don't just attract butterflies. They also can attract moths. Yes. Now, I'm sure we've got some people out there going, why in the world would I want to attract moths? And um, as Adriana knows, I am a... I'm a lover of moths. Of course, not clothes moths. I'm a knitter, so I don't love clothes moths. You're saying moths, moths. not moss. Yes, not moss, moths. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but moths are just fascinating, beautiful creatures. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a night owl, so I don't get my full enjoyment of moths. But they're mostly active at night. And because the white flowers are more visible at night and because they are full of nectar, they are more likely to attract moths than other flower colors. Sure. So um, I would say if you're, if you're sitting there saying, I don't know if I want to attract moths, trust me, you do. There are so many amazing moths that are native to North America uh, that you can see in your garden if you have plants that actually attract them. So to me, that's a big, big reason to grow this particular plant. On a hot July or August night, fun to watch. Right. Very fun to watch. Beautiful. Very summery. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know a lot of people are probably also thinking like, wait a minute, I heard butterfly bush is bad. And I heard it's bad for butterflies, so it's probably bad for moths. Um, and, you know, the answer, so the reason that people think that is because butterfly bush do not serve as a host for butterfly larva or the caterpillars. And um, that's a, it's obviously an extremely crucial part of a butterfly's life cycle. And so, you know, my answer to people who say, oh, well, don't plant butterfly bush. It doesn't sustain a butterfly through its whole life cycle is that, you know, anytime you're gardening for butterflies or moths, um, there's no bread alone kind of answer. Like, oh, you don't just plant this one thing and then pat yourself on the back and walk away. Right. You know, it is a whole total approach to your garden with a wide variety of foods, just like you would not want to subsist on one type of food. Um, so having a, a wide variety of different types of plants, you know, we would never say like just plant butterfly bush and, and say it's good. It's, it can be a part of a butterfly garden, but it's not the whole answer. And one of the reasons why I think that butterfly bush are very effective in many gardens is because uh, they bloom so long. You know, they basically, yeah. they start blooming in July and they're really not going to stop until the nights get quite long and cool in late September. So that also offers that really long window of flowers to support butterflies while they're migrating, getting ready to go dormant during all of those really crucial periods where they need a lot of nectar. So I don't think that butterfly bushes are bad. It's just that they are not the sole answer or sole solution to any time you're trying to make your landscape more friendly to well insects. said well said diversity in the landscape is so important and yeah. this ties in and then you add to it as you mentioned those beautiful white flowers the interest in moon gardens mm. and of course our topic today sunburn or heat i looked it up stacy and it's listed for heat zone nine which means According to the American Horticultural Society map, it can handle 150 days of above 86 degree wow. temperatures. That's so, impressive. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, so butterfly bush in general are a very sun loving and heat tolerant plant. So they don't necessarily need the heat. I mean, they will certainly bloom just fine for us here in West Michigan, even though we are having a milder summer, which by the way, if you are in a hot climate, Look into visiting West Michigan for your summer vacation. Our weather is good. Hopefully, it will stay that way. Just you. want to say, if you want to escape, we got room for you. Uh, but come um, on down. <laughs> but it, it, you know, they they bloom very well in normal conditions, and they will continue to bloom very well in very hot conditions. So, it's a really good choice if if you have unpredictable weather. You know, I think a lot of the people like in Missouri who really never know what they're going to get. You know, they have very cold winters. Their summers can be scorching sure. and, you know, that can make it really difficult. So um, if you have, if you're worried about heat, you want something that's just going to bloom and bloom and you won't have to worry about it and you won't have to be out there deadheading or fussing with it because it is too darn hot. I think butterfly bush is a great choice. And I think pugster white butterfly bush is an especially nice choice. And of course, you can always mix it with the other colors because all of the colors are Really just, you know, beautiful pugster blue, of course, is our most popular. It's a thriller. Not only can you mix it with the other colors, but pugster white is the perfect plant to mix with perennials yes. in your garden. It will get, you know, like I said, it's a social butterfly. I think it, it does very well. 
You know, and a lot of people do think of butterfly bush as a perennial, but it is actually a shrub. Right. It does make woody growth, and in that way, it is a shrub. Now, we're running out of time at this particular moment, so um, I do have tips, of course, for growing butterfly bush successfully, but right now, all you need to know, full sun, very, very well-drained soil. Do not plant butterfly bush in any soggy spot. It will not last long at all, um, but they are easy to grow and a great choice for whatever kind of hot climate challenges uh, your weather could be throwing at. So visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com to get all of the details and visit your local garden center to find a pugster white butterfly bush to add to your garden. We're going to take a little bit of break. When we come back, we've got the garden mailbag. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of my favorite times of the week where we open up the garden mailbag and help you with your garden questions, which are, of course, abundant as we are here in full swing. And th speaking of things that are abundant, the hydrangeas in our trial and display garden are amazing. And we really wanted to share that with all of you. So if you tune into our YouTube channel, we are going to have an exclusive tour of the hydrangeas Yay. and a few other surprises in our trial garden. So Rick and I will be out there and, and making a video and kind of giving you the lay of the land. So please do uh, take a look at the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs channel on YouTube if you would like to get that little behind the scenes look at what's going on. It's prime time. It is. At, and for hydrangeas, it is definitely prime time. And uh, of course, we do have a lot of hydrangea questions that we can't get to because, uh, you know, I always want to talk about hydrangeas but it's sometimes it's like too much. We won't have enough time to get to enough questions. So we've always got resources for you at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. But what do we got in the mailbag today? Well, Jim writes to us, why do my pepper plants look like I just planted them? They've been in the ground since Memorial Day weekend, and they haven't grown two inches. Two years now, it's done this. What's the problem with my peppers? And i tell you what, Stacy, this is a question I've received many times over throughout my career and uh, is a real frustration for folks. Well, so what has your answer been? Well, generally with peppers, I mean, first of all, we've got to take a look at bright light. We need lots of light, lots of sunlight. Uh, they're also heat sensitive. In other words, uh, they like daytime temperatures that are 70, 80 degrees. They fruit you know, when, when the temperatures are 75 to 85 degrees. And so the first point is if they were planted out too early or mm -hmm. planted into cold, wet soil, it's one of those plants that needs well-drained soil, but also needs moisture. There's a multitude of things that can cause that uh, stunting with peppers. Yeah, you're absolutely right about the cold. If they are planted too cold, it sets them back. And you would think that they would be able to make it up by the time it's getting real sunny and warm. But that's not necessarily the case. You know, I always think any time that you are seeing limited top growth, that uh, indicates that the root growth is being similarly limited. You know, yes. a plant can only grow on top as much as its root system can support. So if you're not seeing top growth, the problem almost always lies in the roots. And that I, I found that to be, that's a great point, Stacey. Compressed soil, I've seen that often stunt peppers. Yeah. And, you know, one thing is that um, I have heard and seen myself is peppers do not really love high peat soils. So um, they recommend if you're starting your own pepper seeds that you avoid peat. They can actually still germinate, but it's it's harder for them. Um, if you, of course, are growing in a container and using a potting mix, um, look for one with lower peat. Usually those are going to be balanced enough that that's not an issue. But if you have like a really peaty soil, you, you're adding peat moss to your garden or have a peat moss top dressing, I think that could potentially be an issue. Or you could have, you know, things like moles and voles disrupting things underground there, sure. or uh, like grubs, you know, eating um, the roots. And, you know, I think it's interesting that you mentioned light, because usually I think if someone's growing vegetables, they know that vegetables need full sun. And it sounds like Jim is a pretty experienced vegetable gardener from what he says here. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that sites tend to grow more shady over time. You know, trees grow up, people plant things, and the same place that you've been planting all along, all of a sudden, one year is just 
not great for vegetables anymore. Yeah, that's true. Now, of course, feeding the peppers right from the start, I like to use a complete fertilizer that also has the micronutrients in it, mix it into the soil. And then I think the important thing to bear in mind here, Stacy, is that a pepper, when it's planted out into the garden, has to integrate itself into the soil. We talked about the compressed soil or shade or other issues, but remember that whether Jim's starting these pepper plants from seed indoors or if they came from the greenhouse, they started their life in pretty posh conditions. No, that's true. No wind, no stress, nothing. Then you put them out in the garden. If there is some sort of stress, like standing water, cold soil, whatever it may be, I find that with peppers, it's super important that they are hardened off before they go into the garden. And in addition to that, the first few flowers that come on the plant, pick them off. Oh, so put I more do. energy into the into the plant. Um, well, you know, speaking of pepper seeds, did you hear about the big pepper seed mix up that happened this year? Is this a, a joke? No, no, it's punch actually line? that does sound like the setup to a joke. I'm sure you're th working on a punchline right now, <laughs> but no, actually, it isn't. Um, so I don't know if you heard this. This is pretty wild. There was a huge seed lot mix up, and so some of the big big growers who wow. supply box stores with pepper plants. Um, instead of jalapenos, they were banana pepper plants. Oh my. So all these people who thought they were going to be growing jalapenos are starting to fruit out and it turns out they are actually banana peppers, <laughs> which, you know, I get it. If you really wanted to grow jalapenos, it's kind of disappointing, but I would encourage people if you are the victim of this mix up to, uh, look on the bright side. And that is the jalapenos are always easy to find and pretty inexpensive. Banana peppers, not so much. So yeah. you have something, you might have a new favorite and, uh, hopefully it won't happen again. So I don't know how widespread it is in Michigan, but I've heard a lot of people are experiencing a lot of confusion out there. <laughs> so what do we got next? Joyce is wondering, can I transplant June bearing, June bearing strawberry plants in September? And I would say June, it depends on where you are, or Joyce, rather, sorry, June is your strawberry. <laughs> uh, it depends on where you're located. But if you are in a cooler climate, say like USDA zone three through six, I think September is a fine time to start transplanting. You might want to wait until a little bit later. And I'd say that's true, not just of your strawberry plants, but anything, any perennials that you need to transplant. You know, I um, usually wait until spring to do my transplanting and that works fine from a plant health standpoint. But one of the things that I find is that I no longer have the perception of scale. Uh, you know, when you're not, when you don't have the plant growing and seeing how big it is and seeing True. how big its surroundings are, you kind of misjudge. I mean, I, maybe not you. No, no, <laughs> I no. definitely no, misjudge um, how much space everything needs because of course in spring, everything looks spacious. So I would say by all means, um, September is a fine time. Just wait until a little, a little bit later in the month. And if you are in a hotter climate, I would wait even into early October um, to, to actually do that. So that just so that the weather is a little bit cooler and it's easier for the plant to grow roots and recover from the transplanting. Yeah, I would agree. September is a great time. Make sure you feed them when you move them. If you're pulling up some of these runners, moving the plants and planting these June bearing strawberries in September. Um, again, soil preparation, really important well-drained soil, rich soil, but well-drained soil. And uh, as you pull them out of the ground, maybe have some wet paper towel handy, mm. wrap the roots in that, uh, make sure your new area is prepared and plant away. Great yep. time to do it. One of my favorite pieces of advice, make sure your new area is prepared before you start digging. And you might not get it exactly right, but it's better to just have to dig or change things a little bit then have the plant sitting there out of the soil while you try to fix everything. Well-rooted advice, Stacy. Angie writes, I'm looking to make a bed of perennials and shrubs for cutting flowers. Zone 3, Alberta, Canada. Would love your suggestions. Well, I, I love that you want to plant a cutting garden. I think it's one of the most underrated aspects of gardening. I mean, what's better than going into your own backyard and being exactly. able to cut an amazing bouquet? Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, the, the list is so long. I was like, how do we even start to answer Angie's question? But since it is the height of summer, I think one of my first recommendations would be a dwarf panicle hydrangea, mm. like Bobo mm -hmm. or a little lime, little lime punch, tiny quick fire. Um, I mean, of course, the big ones make great cut flowers, too, like Limelight Prime, Pinky Winky Prime. But I find that um, unless you have really large scale vases, they can be a little bit hard to arrange because they're 
really right. large. They're big. And I think that the the dwarf varieties, and these are perfectly hardy to USDA Zone 3, Angie, um, they're perfect for arranging, and they give you such a long uh, window of, of supply. Yeah. On our website, I just want to supply you a list, Angie, <laughs> of some of the plants that I would suggest. And Stacy, one that popped into mind right away for me, as it relates to flowering shrubs, we talked about it a few weeks ago, the Centara lilac. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, hardy. I saw that it was hardy to zone two yep. or three. Very, very hardy. Plant. Very, yeah. very hardy. So they're in Alberta, Canada. Boy, in the month of uh, May, June, being able to uh, to clip some lilacs, wow. And I think that's an important, you know, thing to consider when you're planning a garden for cutting. And you don't have to just have like, hey, this is my cutting garden. Everything's, you know, right. relegated to this area. You can certainly incorporate these throughout your landscape and gardens. Um, but it is important to consider that seasonality so that you have something, you know, interesting and beautiful to cut really from, you know, the first daffodil in spring all the way until those uh, snowflakes fly. Oh, those summertime helianthus, heliopsis, oh my. And I think they do great in Alberta, Canada. Yeah, too. they should, absolutely. And, you know, it's not exactly a perennial for you in Zone 3, but uh, it's hard to go wrong when you want cutting flowers for with dahlias. Yeah. And you can always lift the bulbs and store them, and they get bigger and better every year. And what's a garden without some dahlias? Truffula pink gomfrina. Okay, don't get us started <laughs> don't get here. Us started. Here we go. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we have a special guest, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. Not breaking news, but branching news, and we don't make this stuff up. And today, branching news, Stacy involves an interview with a fabulous lady. You may know her from YouTube as Bree the Plant Lady or have visited her website, BreeGrows.com. She's a garden influencer, author, speaker, horticulturist, a best-selling author, I should say, and a true, I'm going to call it, kicking the plants and friend, Bree Arthur uh, from North Carolina. Bree Thanks for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Show. No, oh, thank you so much for having me. Now, Bree, you were recently in West Michigan, touring West Michigan. I wanted to ask you right off the bat, I know you spent a little time at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs and then also at Walter's Gardens, Proven Winners Perennials. It's quite amazing what's happening here in West Michigan, isn't it? All the best genetics are coming out of Western Michigan, <laughs> most incredible thing to see it's just i'm still reeling from my trip and i think i took a thousand photographs <laughs> <laughs> oh that's fantastic well let's talk about north carolina we're going to start with heat because of course today we talked about sunscreen and sun scald and and uh you know the plant's ability to be able to hand uh, handle a certain amount of sun but we have been dealing with uh, extreme temperatures throughout the United States and throughout the world the past uh, year, and some plants have been affected. I noticed on a tour of your garden, and folks, I encourage you to take that tour. You just go to YouTube and look for Bree the Plant Lady. Uh, you had uh, mangaves in your landscape. Is that what you had? I do. I'm I'm trialing them for for cold hardiness through the winter. I suspect they won't be totally reliable, but it's I you know it's okay. I'm I'm always trying to push the limits and and see you know the reality of climate now. Which there is basically no consistency. I think that's the hardest thing for gardeners and, and educators to be able to share advice is that you literally don't know what's going to happen next and. We here in North Carolina actually had a very mild early summer with cooler than normal temperatures and a lot of rain. And then the middle of July, it's just like a switch flipped. And we're back to what I would consider to be pretty normal. 21 years in North Carolina, you know, it's, it's unbearably hot here in the summertime. Sure. But we haven't really had any uh, substantial rain in, in about six to eight weeks now and uh, definitely plants are, are showing the struggle from temperatures in the, you know, upper 90s and, and feel like temperatures well over 100 degrees. It's just yesterday I was showing um, the effects of 
Hedicium ginger lily, which is hardy here in zone seven, um, going from being in a very shaded condition, I had some trees removed and, you know, just within a few days, all the leaves are scalded and wow. I have not been doing my due diligence of keeping that area watered. Well, Stacy, uh, Bree was uh, an inspiration to me. She still is, but was an inspiration to me a number of years ago when she came out with her foodscaping book. And uh, again, if you watch Bree on YouTube, you will see how she incorporates zucchini and uh, buckwheat and peppers into her ornamental garden. Uh, I call you cutting hedge there, Bree, uh, because you were on this a long time before many other people were. But I have to say in my garden, too, you were an inspiration to get me to mix in ornamental plants with, uh, with food, vegetable plants. Well, that makes my heart sing. I, you know, I always laugh because uh, it really shouldn't be revolutionary. Vegetables need the same care as most of your really common full sun ornamental plants. And mm-hmm. why wouldn't you put them in a convenient location that you walk past every day, that you have an easy access to a hose? They're actually going to notice them instead of banishing them to the farthest corner of your backyard. Your vegetables are your highest maintenance requirement plants they need they need you to actually pay attention to them and um i just think part of the the goal of foodscaping is just to get people to recognize they can be really beautiful when you manage them correctly and you're going to manage them correctly when you look at them every day well and you know vegetables are beautiful between the foliage and the flowers and the colorful fruit i mean there aren't that many ornamentals that can kind of give you all of that and you get to eat it on top of that. And I do love to combine um, edibles and ornamentals, but my problem is I have a terrible deer issue. So, so my vegetables yeah. have to stay firmly in their little um, deer proof prison and uh, not mix too much. Now I can grow like extremely hot peppers uh, mixed in with my ornamental containers they knock on wood don't seem to bother those, but um, there's pretty much n- nothing, almost nothing edible. <laughs> as much as I would love to have that look that you have, and I'm so envious. Uh, the deer definitely put the kibosh on it for me, unfortunately. The deer are a nightmare, and of course, it, you know it's it's everywhere. It's it's every gardener's problem, and I've, yeah. I've been seriously considering writing. Another book just on really creative strategies for managing it because it's something that's only getting worse, develop more land. And, you know, there's a handful of tricks you can employ. Uh, Like, you know, deer tend to not like the smell of garlic and onions or chives, things in the allium family. So if you line bed edges with that, it kind of helps give a first line of defense. You know, there's some really smelly plants like marigolds. Um, arugula, mustard, that can help, again, just sort of deter them. It's not like you're getting rid of them. You know, my adage is I'm just sending them to my neighbor's yard. (laughs) (laughs) May or may not make my neighbors like me. (laughs) Exactly. You mentioned, you know, in following you, Bree, I I picked up on this. You mentioned Plectranthus, and that caught my attention because uh, I love Plectranthus. So many fascinating varieties of plectranthus but you mentioned that as a plant also that can help in deterring animals it's really quite practical i mean most of the plectranthus that we would commonly grow are going to be treated as summer annuals so it's not a solution year-round but you know if you ever rub those leaves and sometimes plectranthus is called cuban oregano there's actually 350 different species of plectranthus it's an enormous collection of plants but they usually have really strongly scented foliage and often they have like a pubescence on their leaves and that all helps deter things like deer and rabbits that you know are the most common browsers and you know what i love about them is you can put them in pots and they're a great trailing element but you can also grow them in the ground as a ground cover and you know again it's it's all about like layering bad smells (laughs) <laughs> sure, exactly. To, to try and trick these critters. <laughs> well, the nice thing about Plectranthus is it might smell bad to deer, but it, it pretty much usually smells wonderful to humans. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I laugh about that with arugula. I happen to really like arugula, but 
animals really don't. And so that's an easy plant just to sprinkle seed again along bed edges. And, um, you know, you can harvest it for yourself, but you know, I've watched rabbits go up to my edges of arugula and they like, they smell it and they just get so mad. They just like run, they run to the next yard. They're like, forget it. I don't like you. <laughs> you like arugula too, I, right? I do. I love arugula. And I was, we were just saying on break that, um, I have wild arugula self-sowing in my garden, um, abundantly, which is absolutely amazing because I can pretty much grab an arugula salad anytime that I want from like spring until frost. <laughs> Unfortunately, my rabbits don't eat it and the deer don't eat it, but the rabbits definitely do not run away. They just kind of thread themselves through the arugula to get to the stuff they really want. <laughs> <laughs> I should let my cat be on borrow, you know? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, I love arugula, Brie, because I'm just arugula guy. That's a bad pun. But you, yeah. Anyhow. you have the best pun. Uh, <laughs> hey, a uh, couple quick things I wanted to ask you. Uh, I love the tomato plants in your yard there in North Carolina, and you often talk of cream sausage tomato, which is a variety I haven't tried. That sounds interesting. It's, life, it's a life-changing tomato. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. <laughs> it is. It's, you know, it's just one of those oddities. I originally got it because I thought the name was funny, and I, I bought the seed from Baker <laughs> Creek Heirloom Seed, and I was just like, well, why not? I'm, I'm, you know, trying all these different varieties of heirlooms. And year after year, I think I'm 15 years in with growing it, it still remains my favorite. And it's just one of those things that, like it's easy, it's easy to grow. You can do it in a pot. You can do it in the ground. Um, it doesn't grow exponentially. It's a semi-determinant. Mm. So you you know use a normal sized tomato cage and that'll manage it. And unlike many of the like Roma type tomatoes or paste varieties, this isn't determinant in that it flowers and blooms all at once and then it's finished it will continuously flower and set fruit all the way until you have a hard frost. Wow. Mm, wow. And it's only 60 days Ooh. from seeding to setting the first fruit. So you really get a long season of harvest and it makes a wonderful sauce. It's great as salsa, but I also just like it, you know, just sliced and put on a sandwich. Mm. So it's just one of the most versatile tomatoes and the abundance of yielding, I think, is what makes it so practical. You know, you can wait all summer long for a big, juicy red slicer, and you get, like, two fruit from a huge plant. And there's cream sausage just, you know, going to town. Every day you're out harvesting a couple more, and it's just really satisfying. Now, this, <laughs> this might be a silly question, but I feel like I have to ask it because I have a picture in my head. Is it, in, in fact, a white tomato? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It, oh, when okay. it's ripe, it's actually kind of a pale yellow. Oh. And it is aroma type, so it, it kind of looks like a sausage. So it's sort of a cream colored sausage. <laughs> Interesting. <Okay. laughs> the name is quite literal. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> And fantastic. it does make a creamy sauce. So, oh. like, you know, I have a terrible food allergy from a tick infection. Um, so I, I can't have any dairy or anything from a mammal. And so I can trick myself into thinking I'm having primavera when I'm using my cream sausage as my tomato-based sauce. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Your enthusiasm is uh, infectious here, uh, Bree, and appreciate it. Love, uh, love watching uh, your YouTube videos uh, when you take the amazel basil, mint, cucumber, and citrus and make us a good old summertime cocktail from the garden also. Well, you know, for me, I think... Part of the joy of gardening is the daily use. And mm -hmm. what I hope to show through my YouTube is how wonderful the hobby of gardening is. And just spend a few minutes every day, what you get is this enriched lifestyle. And, you know, it's not about just going to the garden center once in the spring. It's about interacting with your plants on a regular basis. And why not grow what you want to toss into a cocktail exactly. or a mocktail and enjoy it. You know, that's the point of the effort. Exactly. 
And it's about, you know, enjoying the life in the garden. And Bree, uh, I know Stacy, and she loves insects. She loves birds. And I know you have something, correct me if I'm wrong, but you call it a feet tank in your landscape where you'll sit at ground level and in, enjoy the insects and the frogs in the evening hours. Tell us about that. <laughs> the cheap way to get a swimming pool <laughs> so it is literally a feed tank from tracker supply <laughs> and you know we have a leech field so we couldn't really put a swimming pool in uh, so this was our way around it and in the winter we just put a little fountain in and it looks like a water feature but you know it's dug into the ground and unlike most swimming pools that are surrounded by concrete this one is surrounded by plants. I've, I've got these fabulous proven winter coleus and then um, a basil basil on the corners. Uh, and so when you're in the pool, you're basically like safe level with the ground. And mm. it's so remarkable. I mean, I have uh, Asclepias tuberosa planted in that bed. So I get great uh, monarch caterpillar activity. And then they actually make their chrysalis on the underside of the coleus, and you can see it up close and personal. And I also share the feed tank with a family of leopard frogs mm. who eat the mosquitoes, so it works out really, really nicely. And it just feels like a much more authentic, for me, authentic pool situation. It's also really easy to manage. I have a filter and a pump, and I keep it chlorinated, and I, I vacuum it like a normal pool. But it's only like eight foot wide and across and about three foot deep. So it doesn't take very long to keep it clean, unlike a giant swimming pool. Well, that's cool. <laughs> I was saying, this is a pool for cocktails, not for exercise. I love it. I, I'm like getting ideas over here. I hope my husband's listening. And correct me, is this a feet tank or a feed tank? It's a feed tank, like, ah. like that, that animals would drink out of. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. You're talking to the right person, Bree, because uh, Stacy is, I call her the Asclepius Queen. <laughs> she loves butterflies and has talked often to our listeners, viewers, about Asclepius. I'm the Canna King. And by the way, in your most recent issue, you mentioned that cannas are messy. So you and I are going to have to have a talk about that. <laughs> Well, we are. I'll tell you why. It's because we have such a problem with leaf rollers here. Oh. Uh, in part because we don't get cold enough to kill off a lot of the problem bugs. So I shouldn't say, I should frame that in that I love pannas in, nor in northern climates where they look beautiful. Here in the southeast, the stock on leaf rollers just chew them up to pieces and they always look tattered. Mm. Oh, that's <laughs> such a bummer. But you know what? I think you have the same kind of attitude, it sounds like, about gardening that I do, which is just like, you know what? If, if it's not working, it's not worth it. You know, like there's exactly. other things. There's so much more to discover and things to fall in love with. And, you know, why make try to make a square peg fit into a round hole when you can just go find something that's easier and more beautiful and doesn't attract leaf rollers or whatever? That's exactly it. I mean, what we're so lucky in this, industry, we have an endless plant palette, which couldn't have been more expressed through my trip to Michigan, visiting Walters and Spring Meadow. And I literally had my blind, my mind blown like 4,000 times. I still don't think I've recovered from it all. <laughs> uh, I just the most beautiful plants. And what I really appreciate is how thoughtful the breeders are at addressing the concerns of not only growers, but also home gardeners and making it so plants, you know, do facilitate the needs for pollinators and, you know, bloom longer, um, maybe don't set seeds so there's no invasive qualities, you know, making them the, the size that's appropriate for today's modern day landscape is so critical. And I mean, both everything that's being done at, uh, at the, at the I call them the proven winners headquarters 
uh, you know, Walters and Spring Meadow is just, it's game changing for the industry. It is really, really inspiring to see. Well, you know, that's what it's all about is, you know, if we can get, um, you know, someone to get to that first plant to fall in love with something at the garden center or that they see it online and they get that, you know, then Brie, it's just a few more steps or a few more years until they end up like you or me or Rick or Adriana, where gardening becomes that lifestyle. So really, you know, all of us here at Proven Winners are just trying to get that first foot in the door because we know how easy it is to fall in love with plants and gardening uh, once you kind of have that instant, you know, that that moment. Yeah, very true. And uh, Bree, I've always told people a tomato plant or a pepper plant is the gateway drug to gardening. If you have success with it, well, then before you know it, you're planting hydrangeas and mangavi and having a great time like we are. That is the truth. And, you know, I think there are no other hobbies on this planet that make the world a better place to the degree that gardening does. Wow, you said a mouthful right. there for That's sure. right. That's right. Before we and let- everybody should be proud of every plant they purchase. <laughs> You're making a difference. Exactly. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, exactly. And and on that note, before we let you go, Bree, uh, usually ask folks that we interview this question. I know it's an unfair question, but give our uh, listeners, our radio and podcast listeners, our YouTube viewers, uh, two plants that are are on your must list. Bree loves these plants. Two plants that you suggest for those who are watching or listening to the program? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I well, know. It's not fair. Uh, I know. <laughs> I have to say, this is probably a plant that I'm not going to do very well with, that I was just so intrigued with in, in my visit to Michigan, a still be dark side of the moon. Ooh, mm. That is a very cool um, plant, yeah. You know, I grew up in southeastern Michigan, and out of my bedroom window, I had lilacs and an understory of a stilby. And so, a stilby is remind me of my childhood, but here, I live in a former tobacco field that's all sand, and I just can't water a stilby enough to, yeah. to keep them alive. But I, you know, I'm still going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Well, it's worth a try, it. right? <laughs> you know. And so that would say that is my my new obsession. Like I can't stop thinking about it. That's great. <laughs> um, That's great. And I'm- then I'm looking out my window right now, and you know I I like to really blur the lines between agriculture and home gardening. And I've got a beautiful pot with no drainage holes, filled with purple leafed rice called black mudras. Ooh, mm. interesting. And you know. Everybody has eaten rice, but very few people have ever actually seen it growing or grown it themselves. And this isn't to make it so that I don't buy rice. (laughs) It's a pot. You know, that's a ridiculous notion. It's more the idea of growing something you've never grown before that is very meaningful in the global diet. And it's just an experience for someone to have that's super unique. And I, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of examples with agricultural crops that can be converted for home gardening. But looking out at that purple rice right now, I feel like everybody needs to try that next year. Well, you convinced me. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> Not that it was difficult, but I, I'm on board for cream sausage and the purple leaf rice. So, yeah, <laughs> you know her as Bree, the plant lady. Look for her on YouTube. Go to her website. BreeGrows.com. Talk about a plant enthusiast, influencer. Bree, thank you for all you do for the industry, for influencing people in such a, such a fabulous way. We get excited when we talk plants and gardening. I think you're a total kick in the plants and appreciate you taking some time with us here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Well, you are very welcome and thank you so much for inviting me and I'm so glad that I got to see you last week and I look forward to visiting again next year. That'd be fantastic. Thanks so much, Bree. Enjoy your week. You too. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Wow. That was amazing. That made me want to immediately run out to my garden and appreciate all of my plants. And I hope that you will do the same. I want to thank you for listening. Thanks, Bree, for joining us. Thanks to Rick. Thanks to Adriana. And again, thank you for listening. Have a great week.